And so today, inshallah, I wanted to share with you a bit of history of Palestine. We spoke through, uh, two weeks ago about the virtues of Al-Aqsa. And last week we spoke about how to campaign properly for Al-Aqsa and Palestine. And we made it very clear so that it's not misunderstood by Muslims or non-Muslims that Islam has got nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Because sometimes when you speak about Palestine, people try to confuse it or make it as though that you are anti-Semitic. But our discussion around Palestine is historic, is fact-based, and we have nothing against the people of any faith, Jewish, Christianity or otherwise. In fact, there are Jewish people who speak against the crimes of the uh, Zionist regime or the regime and the, uh, the government of, uh, of Israel. And so our history today, inshallah, starts a long time ago. I have very limited time, so it'll be a summary. If you want to know more, there is enough resources available online um, and offline. There are many books written on the topic. In fact, this khutbah will also be online, so you can refer to it. And our YouTube channel has got loads of information. Uh, all of the khutbahs are recorded and uploaded, so up uploaded there. So if you want to subscribe to there, and you'll get regular updates on what's being uploaded and etc. The history of Palestine is very long. It's more than, th than 6,000 years old. And in fact, it was one of the first places in the world which had human uh, residents. People flocked there and stayed there because of what Allah called in his Quran as Baraka, Barakna Hawla. And this Baraka, someone asked me a question yesterday, and it was a very good question, that if it's a blessed land, why is there so much feuds and warfare around it? We need to understand that Allah has blessed this land, and therefore there is an attraction for it, from a range of people, from people of all different faiths, people have come and stayed there and ruled there and lived there. As for the war aspect, the genocide aspect, the killing aspect is not what God, what God prescribed. So even though it's happened there, it's not what Allah allowed for us or permitted for us or wanted from us. And so just because there is killing there and ongoing war there and historic conflict there, it does not mean or it, not, it does not negate the baraka that Allah speaks about in the Quran of it. We said in the khutbah before last that the baraka is, 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 is seen even in the land itself, how easily and how actually fertile it is, how easily you can plant something and the seeds will grow very fast. And of course, the historic aspects of the prophets that have come and the virtues of going there, visiting there, praying there. And if you go and pray there, the reward is multiplied. And if you come back having prayed there properly with a sincere intention, then your sins are also cleaned off your slate. So it's, it's been there for a very, very long time. It was, in fact, in the Quran, we learn that Ibrahim والسلام, and Sayyidina Lut, and Lut والسلام, was the nephew of Ibrahim They lived in uh, Iraq, what's modern day, modern day Iraq, and when his people tried to persecute him, kick, persecute him and kill him, he migrated to to Bayt al-Maqdis or Masjid al-Aqsa or Philistine, modern day Philistine. And from the progeny of Sayyidina Ibrahim والسلام, were many prophets. As Ibrahim says that Ibrahim when Allah tested Ibrahim with various different tests in his life and he completed and aced every single one of those tests, Allah said, I will make you now an Imam for the whole of mankind. And so Allah says, Allah Ibrahim Khalila, he became the friend of Allah, he's the Imam of humanity. Even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is commanded to follow him. And so because of that dua of Sayyidina Ibrahim, Wamin Dhurriyati that make from my children and progeny also Imams for humanity, we see that there are so many prophets from the descendants of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam. And it is therefore Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are called Abrahamic religions because they came through Ibrahim and his descendants, alayhi salatu wasalam. Though we know as Muslims that Islam was always there. Islam was in fact the submission of one Allah and the Prophet of the time, from the time of Ibrahim, and in fact even before from Nuh, and from the time of Adam, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam's progeny, Ishaq, whose son was Yaqub, whose son was Yusuf and his 11 brothers. And from those brothers and from those children of Yaqub came the tribes of the Banu Israel. In fact, Yaqub another name is Israel. And hence, Banu Israel, the children of Israel, i.e. Yaqub And so they resided People of different backgrounds came and ruled in that area. You've had the Babylonians, the Assyrians, 
the Greeks and the Romans, the Persians, they all attempted and ruled these periods, uh, these, uh, the Philistine area for limited periods of time in history. Even you've had the, uh, even Alexander the Great ruled there for a period of time. And in fact, every time there was a rulership before the Khilafah al Rashida, before Islam, we see huge conflict. When the Romans ruled, they exiled all of the Jewish people. But whereas when Islam ruled, it welcomed and allowed for everyone to coexist in peace and harmony. And that's shown historically when, it, when Umar radiallahu anhu came to receive the keys of Bayt al-Maqdis, he chose not to pray in the church because he said, I don't want Muslims to come afterwards and say that this should have been a mosque because Ibrahim, uh, so, uh, Umar prayed in it. So he prayed outside. So he allowed for the, for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the places of worship of the Christian faith and the Jewish faith to remain. And that coexistence and peaceful harmony is shown in our understanding, even in fiqh, of how we are towards our people of Ahlul Kitab, the people of the books. How Islam, for example, permits for us to eat their meat and marry into, their, marry into, uh, marry into those families as well through, through marriage. <coughs> and there is so much more within Islamic law and legislation that shows and actually establishes a peaceful coexistence between people of all faiths. And history proves, as we've mentioned last week in the article mentioned by Martin Gilbert, that Islam treated the Jewish people of Jewish faith amazingly. There was success and prosperity for all people of faith. But then when the Crusaders, who under the banner of Christianity, came and attempted to dominate, and in fact, you know, dominated and, and ruled viciously and mercilessly over Bayt al-Maqdis, in one day, 700,000 Palestinians were killed. It was a massacre, it was, it was a bloodbath. And it was merciless, it was, it was inhumane. And then thereafter, Allah allowed for the, uh, the, uh, the, the Ayyubid Sultan, the Sult Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Rahmatullahi alayhi wa alim, who was the liberator of Philistine. He came and he opened Philistine to once again be a home and a hub for people of all faiths. He sent message to people of Yemen, Jewish people in Yemen and other parts of the Middle East to come and reside once again as they did before, before the oppression of the Crusaders. And it was so under the Ottoman and the Uthmani Khilafah also. The Uthmani Khilafah invited and allowed for people of all faiths to prosper. There were scientists, there were medics, there were physicians, there were politicians. They had all of these posts in the Khilafah al Uthmaniyya. And of course, during the Islamic history, we had a change of Khilafah. We had the Umayyad Khilafah, the Abbasid Khilafah. We had the, for example, the Mamluki Khilafah. We had the Fatimid Khilafah, the Ayyubid Khilafah. We had the Uthmani Khilafah, and so on. The Uthmani Khilafah, when it was eventually brought down at the end of the World War I, in which there was a huge contribution from the British and the French. And even before that, when there was a rise of nationalism, meaning everyone is now associating themselves to a particular nation, for example, Brits and French and you know, even, even the Arabs had these nationalist movements coming up. There was a huge persecution in the hands of the Europeans for the Jewish people. The Holocaust was not done by Arabs, it was done by European people. Six million Jews were killed and massacred in, and, and, and in gas chambers and the Holocaust is known. It was not done, it had no connection to Islam or Muslims at all. And so when this persecution was ongoing in Europe, the Jewish people naturally were looking for a safe haven, a home to go to, somewhere to call home, somewhere to be safe, somewhere to escape persecution. And so within the Jewish communities, there was discussion, where can this be, where can this be? And then slowly came the movement of Zionism. Theodor Herzl, who was a Jewish journalist, he answered in one of his articles that this homeland, he suggested a few options. It could be Philistine, it could be Argentine, it could be some other countries in Africa. And slowly, the inclination towards making Philistine a homeland for all of the Jewish people, and that to be a wholly and solely Jewish state, became more and more popular. This became the Zionist movement and there was a popular slogan called that said that a land without people for a people without land. Land without people meaning Palestine. Palestine was not a land without people. It had almost a million people living there, half a million people living there. They were residents, they were the, ori the original resi residents of that country. So the notion that come and stay there 
migrate from wherever you are because it's an empty land was false to start off with. And it led to what later became ethnic cleansing, genocide, colonization. Because people that were coming there, a lot of them, had the imagination that the F Palestinians either were not people or non-existent. And that ideology was problematic, it was huge, and this is not, again, me, this is history proven, it's written, it's, it's, it's recorded by Jewish historians, by, like I said last time, Ilan Pape and others, who is a Jewish person himself, but he does not believe in this kind of massacre and persecution, colonization, and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. In 1917, there was something called the uh, uh, James, Arthur James Balfour, who was the foreign secretary at that time of the UK. And interestingly enough, he was in fact anti-Jewish himself. He is the one that announced that we will allow for Jews to have a national homeland in Palestine. How did that happen? When the Uthman, Khilaf al-Uthmaniyya was taken down at the end of World War I, right? Now Britain and, and, and France, literally, the Levant area, they divided between themselves. The Sykes and uh, Peacoat, I believe, those are the two people that were, that were involved. And they divided, and in the British part of it was Philistine and Jordan and Lebanon and, 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 uh, and, and those areas. And so Britain, now having the rulership and having taken it from the, uh, the Ottomans, actually just literally said, we will give you a homeland in Palestine. Britain had no authority to do so. These lands belong to Palestinians. <coughs> And so until now and throughout history, throughout the 100 year history, we find Britain and its allies continuously supporting and standing for those who are against Palestinians. This is not again, this is not a, a conspiracy theory. We can see history is there. Of course, history is written by the historians. We have to choose who we read for that history. And so the, the situation that we are right now in, in Palestine, is not complicated at all. Some people say it's complicated, it's complex, it's an ongoing, it's a thousand year old problem. No, it's not. People in Palestine were living in harmony in the 19th century, before the end of the Uthmani Khilafah. And then when you had mass forceful immigration and stealing of land and persecution and genocide, and Ilan Pape in his book Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine talks about a lot of this stuff. He takes historic accounts of how villages were literally massacred, killed, harmless, Unarmed people were killed. Hundreds of villages were just wiped out for the benefit of the colonizers. And so it's not complicated. And the reason why I'm sharing this information with you is so that we ourselves are conscious and we learn. Islam teaches us about learning. Having historic knowledge gives you information, gives you power. We need to know what happened. And I said in my Bangla part of this advice is that Islam says seeking knowledge is mandatory. It's referring to the amount of knowledge required for you to practice your deen properly. That includes your salah and your zakat and your hajj and your umrah and etc. But it also includes information which is relevant to your history that will make you alert and know who you are, where you came from and what's happening around you. We're not supposed to be just living in a cave and not knowing what's around us. And so may Allah give us all tawfiq to understand, to seek knowledge, to study history and understand that speaking about Palestine as many people try to assume entails any form of anti-Jewish hate. No, it does not. We're speaking for the Palestinian people and the history of it, and there's nothing anti-Semitic or problematic about that. We have freedom of speech, if you like, to at least speak about these historic facts, inshallah. May Allah give us all tawfiq understanding and give us the ability to continuously campaign for Palestine and its people until this situation is brought to justice and there is peace long-term peace for that region, for the Palestinians and the entire uh, Middle East, inshallah.